Dr. Marg Ross is a consultant, a clinical psychologist, and the clinical lead in Australia's first ever psychedelic clinical trial. This trial is based at St. Vincent's Hospital here in Melbourne and investigates the ability of psilocybin-assisted therapy to alleviate anxiety and depression in terminally ill patients. Marg is going to talk to us today about the study's progress, existential distress, research in the area to date, and why psilocybin-assisted therapy will assist the terminally ill. Welcome, Marg. Thanks for having me. Thank you for inviting me to EGA Central and massive shout out to the EGA crew who are bringing uh, the uh, talks today to you in Technicolor and, and HD. Um, again, thank you for having me. Um, as you can imagine, um, there's a hell of a lot I could talk about today, but uh, I'll try and keep it uh, brief so that we've got some time for questions. Please put your questions through to me. I'm not quite sure uh, what you'd like to hear about, so I'm more than happy to take some questions um, around this area. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about um, uh, the context of what it's like for a terminally ill person um, and what they face and why psilocybin-assisted therapy may be helpful for the terminally ill patient. Um, and also I'll talk a little bit about the research to date and talk a little bit about our study. We're about halfway through, but I'll talk a little bit about the details of that um, shortly. All right, so look, I guess one of the things that I really want to get across to people is what it feels like for a terminally ill patient and what they're facing in their life. As you know, terminal illness can be a massive assault on one's sense of identity. Um, all of a sudden, life as they know it is just completely dissolved and the, the sense of future is foreshortened. Um, and, you know, they have to undergo often quite um, dramatic treatments. Uh, their bodies can be quite dramatically altered or disfigured by disease, by the treatments themselves. Um, and this can really rupture one's uh, relationship to their body and to also the world around them and their, um, you know, how they feel in relationship to those around them who have healthy bodies. Um, and I think, you know, when you think about what it's like to lose one person in your life, you know, that's, that's hard enough. For the person who is dying, they're losing every single person that they know in their life, all their friends or their family, all at once. Um, so, you know, this is annihilation of the self. This is a very, uh, you know, it's, an, it's a huge psychological event for them. So um, as you can understand, there's a lot going on for them psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, physically as well. The other thing that, that can happen for people who have terminal illness is they often feel very reduced to their illness and they're very, uh, I guess, um, kind of, uh, they become quite bounded, like there's a physical uh, boundedness to them as they become, you know, they experience sort of loss of control, um, loss of their role, you know, um, you know, being a mum or a dad or, you know, having a, having a, a job. Um, there's enormous symptom burden and then there's a progressive dependency on others. So they have this body that sort of has betrayed them and there's enormous fear and a lot of uncertainty and there's this kind of this physical boundedness as life gets sort of smaller and smaller for them. Um, and I guess the, the other thing that can happen for them is that they're forced to then have this relationship with death while everyone around them is in going on with the business of living. So on top of that, they can have this really quite profound existential loneliness that can go on for them as well. The fact that they then have this sort of foreshortened future um, you know, the, then they've got this existential boundedness as well. So all of a sudden, you know, um, this this idea of the future plans and what they wanted to do and what they wanted to, to experience just starts to become uncertain or just completely impossible. So there's enormous grief there. So I guess I just wanted to paint a picture of that because it's, uh, you know, a lot going on for the patient um, when, you know, they're facing terminal illness. And um, so it makes a lot of sense from a mental health point of view that um, the the prevalence of mental health you know um, disorder, I say disorder, there's um, there's a hell of a lot going on here. So we've got you know 25 to 30 percent of cancer patients will meet criteria for a diagnosis of depression or anxiety or adjustment disorders. So we've got much higher rates of depression and anxiety than the general population. Um, also, want to point out there's there's probably a lot more that would actually meet criteria for you know quite the a sort of protracted demoralization uh, and anxiety that perhaps maybe even wouldn't meet criteria but these people are really sort of suffering quite silently um, 
also worth pointing out as well, there's, there's a big difference between anticipatory grieving, which is very healthy and adaptive response to what they've been told, you know, they're about to lose their life. So, um, but this is more than that. This is when the distress becomes so terrifying or so preoccupying that they're just unable to experience any kind of pleasure. They become withdrawn. They, they're not interacting in their usual ways. So, or that they become so preoccupied and so sort of ruminative that then, you know, just everyday life feels quite terrifying for them. So, you know, so it's it's not that kind of normal kind of, I guess, adaptive and healthy grief that we're looking at. This is uh, ones where, you know, they're really robbed of that precious time that they have left with uh, their loved ones as well. And that, that time is really punctuated by these thudding reminders that their life is coming to an end. So we also know that, that psychological distress at end of life can really... Um, um, increase people's experience of pain. Um, it can increase their experience of nausea. It gives them sleep disturbance as well. So we know that anguish makes the physical symptoms of their disease much worse as well. So how do we treat it? At the moment, we've roughly got treatment that falls into two categories. We've got, um, I guess, uh, psychological treatments, so talking therapies, creative therapies like music therapy, art therapy, um, and then there's medications. Um, neither are perfect. For some people, they, they work quite well. But then there's a, a small percentage of the population that just don't respond to either of those treatments and they remain quite terrified and quite depressed as well. Um, I won't, won't get into too much of the, the problems with, with the medications, but unfortunately, um, uh, I guess particularly with things like antidepressants, it can take six weeks to get clinical benefit. There's a lot of side effects. There's nausea, which can kind of augment their physical symptoms. But also it really doesn't get to the core of the issue. And this is what we were seeing as clinicians. So it's really, um, it was important for us to sort of have a look at see, you know, the emerging treatments and how we could actually get to talk about what was actually going on for them. Um, the talking, I guess, in the waking um, conscious state doesn't appear to kind of get to the core of the issue in the same way that the psychedelic can offer. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um the other, I guess, issue with medications, so things like benzodiazepines, which are used for anxiety, um, these can be a little bit problematic. So people can obviously develop a tolerance quite quickly, so then they need more of the same medication to get the same benefit. Um, and then there's issues of things like withdrawal and, and at you know advanced stages of illness, it then can precipitate a, um, a condition called delirium, which is quite common in, um, in uh, palliative care. And particularly in advanced uh, states of illness, and that's a medical emergency. So there's there's definite problems, unfortunately, and limits with medications. Some people, as I said, will respond to that, but some people won't so well. And um, I guess then there's the talking therapies, and um, unfortunately the, the evidence isn't great. It's sort of moderate at best. Um, um, and unfortunately what we're finding is that that talking will kind of give you a moderate, uh, maybe short-term or momentary relief, but beyond that doesn't really kind of give us more of that kind of longer-term benefit that we're looking for. So we were obviously looking for something else that we could potentially um, use for our, for our patients to sort of help them. And the other thing is as well is that existential distress is really quite visceral and arresting. It's, it's very difficult to, to access again with that, just with that talking therapy, so it's tricky. Um, I don't need to tell you about what psilocybin does. That's something that I have to usually talk to academics about what psilocybin is and the, the uh, effects of psilocybin. But what I would like to talk about is um, obviously it has a very, very rich history of Indigenous use and sacramental use, um, Mesoamerican, um, uh, Indigenous and uh, in healing ceremony. And um, I think the other thing that I'd really like to touch on is actually how we came to understand psilocybin as being something that could potentially help particularly end of life distress and anxiety and there's a really interesting story about a gentleman by the name of Eric Cast who is an anesthesiologist who back in the 60s was looking for um, a new treatment to treat uh, pain in advanced cancer and he'd heard that LSD could potentially uh, disrupt some pain signals and potentially um, um, Get you because I think you know in advanced cancer you can get quite it's quite sort of protracted pain and back in the 60s it was even worse it was much harder to treat so he started to give his cancer patients uh, LSD um, didn't tell them he was giving them LSD so this was uh, some of the questionable research of the 60s um, however something that happened that was quite interesting was that it was it, able to disrupt pain signals but the unintended side effect was that they found that LSD really quite dramatically shifted people's attitudes towards death. And they had this sort of quite rapid 
uh, reduction in distress around their anxiety around dying. Um, they sort of reported these sort of oceanic feelings of bounded, you know, uh, boundlessness and increased con- sense of connection to others, and they were much more present and mindful uh, with their families rather than kind of ruminating about their illness. Um, so this sort of kicked off some more research, particularly with with cancer patients in um, in um, uh, Spring Grove Hospital, Maryland Psychiatric Research Centre, sort of in the, the mid fifties, and then obviously then the Controlled Substances Act sort of all brought it to a grinding halt. Um, for at least a couple of decades, but then um, more recently, and I won't go into you know, swathes of detail here, but basically, uh, if you fast forward to the early 2000s, Charlie Grob um, at UCLA uh, conducted a pivotal open label study, which achieved quite remarkable findings, actually, um, even though there were small numbers. But it was actually quite a small dose compared to subsequent studies, and that's including ours, they were looking at, I think, about 0.2 milligrams uh, per kilo of body weight. So now sort of looking around about 0.25. So it's they they were still able to get quite striking findings. Um, and then the other really sort of seminal findings that came out of this, this period were the findings from the Johns Hopkins and NYU studies where they similarly conducted uh, studies examining the effect of psilocybin-assisted therapy um, on depression and anxiety levels in their cancer patients, and their results were pretty compelling to say the least. Um, around 70 to 80 percent were able to achieve remission of depression and anxiety symptoms. And this was after a single therapeutic dose of psilocybin, and these were maintained at six months follow up. And even um, more recently, I think a longer term follow up of the, I think some of the surviving participants from the NYU study uh, found that still, you know, 60 to 80 percent of participants continued to meet criteria for clinically significant antidepressant and um, anti-anxiety response so that was that's pretty staggering and I think you know this is the area of psychedelic assisted therapy that has probably uh, produced the most promising findings and the most robust findings um, to date as well so obviously um, the preliminary findings are suggesting that this is a very effective antidepressant and anxiolytic for people who are um, experiencing, you know, uh, cancer and, you know, um, potentially terminal illness. And the question was sort of why? I think um, there are many features of the psilocybin experience that offer potentially therapeutic opportunities for the terminally ill person. Um, and obviously there's from, from the pharmacokinetic point of view or the, the neurological point of view, psilocybin works very similarly to antidepressants. If you interested in the, in the science of it obviously and some of you may already know this it binds to the 5-HT2A receptors um, you know which is similar to antidepressants so kind of you know floods those receptors as Matt Johnson says it's like getting six weeks of antidepressants in one hit um, but that's about where you know the similarity to antidepressants ends and I'll talk a little bit about that later so from a neuropsychological point of view we know that psilocybin tends to downregulate the default mode network which many of you have probably already heard of. So if, if you don't know about it, the default mode network is a network of brain regions that tend to be more active when we're at rest and when we're more engaged in self-referential thinking. So um, when we're engaging, say, for example, in ruminative sort of thinking, negativistic type thinking, which is quite automated, we see that a lot in, um, in patterns of depression and with anxiety. So if you're thinking about yourself in the past or thinking about yourself in the future, this is when we see, you know, kind of that ruminative negative uh, automated thinking that um, that is you know, quite common in, in the depression, depression depression and anxiety. Sorry, I did have a glass of wine before this, so stumbling over the words a little. Yeah, so basically when this default mode network is down-regulated, it does allow for more expanded and deepened perspective. So it's a way of kind of, I guess, looking um, uh, at old problems with newer um, and expanded uh, you know, ways of thinking, which is they're not usually accessible to that person in their usual waking state. And I think that that's important to point out. Um, so for the terminally ill person, these altered perspectives can really offer them um, an opportunity to, to look at the ruptured relationship with their self, with their body, um, with their illness, their trajectory towards death in a very different way, a very expanded and a very deepened way. You know, all that said, you know, these are these are sort of all the the kind of the, the scientific uh, ways of understanding this. But actually, it's the transcendent experiences that uh, that patients have reported in previous studies that really bring this to another level of healing. Um, so, having you know experiences of mystical and transcendent 
experiences states you know states of bliss and love you know heightened sensory experiences um and if you think for a moment when i was talking before about this idea of feeling physical you know boundedness um you know people who are terminally ill have daily experiences of waking up feeling pain feeling weak feeling frail they can experience their body in a very powerful way that's quite different and not that that boundedness they can experience no pain they can experience um you know um, a sense of aliveness, of eros, of, of sensuality. And this is quite extraordinary and quite a freeing experience for somebody who's terminally ill. So it can offer this quite um, uh, powerful kind of way of experiencing their body um, that, that's so ravaged by illness and the treatments and so forth that they've had to kind of undergo. And they can experience it in a very different way. Um, and they can do it while they're alert. Now that's interesting because actually when we try and medicate, you know, uh, or, or treat pain um, and symptoms in advanced illness, it's usually sedating. They're usually not awake. They're usually, uh, you know, quite dulled alertness and so forth. So this is all happening while they're, they're alert and kind of, you know, experiencing this in its fullest expression. So it's quite a powerful experience for them. Um, and the other thing that it can do is it can interrupt pain signals so they can have that experience of not feeling pain so it's quite a freeing experience for them and, and then there is ego death um, insofar as that they can then have an experience of um, death in the symbolic and in a way that's not terrifying or, or kind of this sort of people have a very Hollywood idea about dying they think they're going to be fully conscious and then they're going to just uh, and, and die quite suddenly um, so it can be quite terrifying to have these ideas or if they've had they've witnessed somebody a loved one die in quite you know um, troubling troubling circumstances then that seems to kind of stick and they get quite quite frightened about this but the from patient accounts having these experiences of um, um, seeing death in the symbolic in a way that's not terrifying but actually could be peaceful that could be quite um, quite beautiful quite um, accepting and and uh, freeing so that can be another way of them kind of experiencing um, I guess their death in a dress rehearsal kind of a way um, but to be able to kind of you know having that sense of losing uh, memory losing um, things that they were attached to in this in this life can be you know a way of promoting acceptance um, and then a number of participants have also re reported experiencing ways of being able to feel at peace with conflicted relationships where there's been you know quite fractured um, histories with with uh, loved ones but then being able to kind of feel a degree of resolution from that so this is um, potentially what psilocybin may be able to cultivate in the person who is terminally ill um, and so obviously we were very interested in this <laughs> um, and so we were very keen to see if we could bring this to our patients in Australia. So um, this is currently where we're at. By the way, this is, I don't need to talk too much about the treatment. I understand, you know, many of you already know what this looks like. I do want to point out one thing though. My mistake at the bottom of this slide says two therapists present at all times. On dose day, there are four therapists. There are two therapists in uh, attendance there is the music and then there is the psilocybin so you have four therapists actually so that was my mistake there so let me just bring you briefly up to speed with where we're at currently so our study at St Vincent's we're about halfway through we're um, hoping to recruit 40 participants who have um, malignant or non-malignant terminal illness by which I mean we're actually we differ from previous research um, and first actually globally to include people who have not only cancer but also non-cancerous terminal illness as well. Our study is a double blind trial which basically means that the patient doesn't know what they're getting and we don't know what they're getting as therapists um, uh, using psilocybin um, versus niacin that's for the first dose but then we actually bring them back for six weeks later and everyone gets an open label dose we didn't feel ethically right about people just getting um, a, a niacin and oh thanks for coming yeah, you got niacin sorry about that I'll see you later no everybody gets at least one um, experience of the full treatment and uh, a 50 percent chance of getting two doses as well. Um, so basically at this point I'm going to now hand over to Q&A but first of all big love to not only Usona who is providing our psilocybin to us for free, PRISM, Dr Martin Williams who's out the back there, thank you sir, who uh, uh, was instrumental in getting this up with me and, um, and schooling me up in, in psychedelic assisted therapy science 
and obviously the the gorgeous team at St Vincent's Hospital Melbourne who made this possible and my dear colleague Dr Justin Dwyer who is who I would not be able to do this without so that said I'm very happy to to have some questions if there are any <laughs> cool thank all right you. thank you Mark no worries <laughs> lovely to hear about this study Thank you. Such a beautiful thing. Yeah, we're, we're really excited to bring it to our patients, actually. And um, I'm desperately wanting to be able to tell you about some of the incredible things that we're experiencing, but I can't do that yet. So just, uh, yeah, give us another year or more. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully cool. we'll be able to cool. publish it soon. <laughs> okay, I've got a couple of questions for you. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I'm in an interesting position kind of where I, yep. I'm online a lot. Mm-hmm. I'm across a few different groups and I, and I get yeah. to see a lot of what... The general community is kind of talking about and chattering about and um, one thing I've noticed is that people in the community are very keen to be able to access psilocybin mm-hmm. yeah. um, and it's fascinating how much people are calling out for a really quite rapid access to this yeah yeah um, yeah but what are your thoughts on this yeah that's it's funny that's that's exactly what we're seeing um, the when we when we were sort of preparing to kind of go, okay, yeah, we're going to be doing this, I think we were all bracing ourselves for this kind of stinging rebuke (laughs) from the community and from academics and so forth. Um, It didn't happen. It actually went the other way. We had enormous, you know, support from the general community. But it kind of, it actually went so far the other way that there's um, now this, like, huge demand for psilocybin-assisted therapy um, and one of the things that we get on a daily basis, we're just absolutely smashed with inquiries um, from people who are not terminally ill, but they're they're wanting to access the treatment. Um, and you know, I think look from from a psychiatry perspective, that makes sense. Obviously, there's you know, Ben Sessa talks about this. We don't use the word cure very often in psychiatry at all, um, and we do need to to look at um, other options here. And you know, there's enormous potential in psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, I think one of the things, though, that what we're noticing, though, is that with the, I guess, the message and the fervor that's going out there, there seems to be this idea that I think it certainly seems to be coming up for us in, in the inquiries as well, that, that people think that it's a, just a, you just kind of lay back, take it, and then that's it. You get the love, you get the bliss, you get the, the you know, serenity now, um, and that they get to kind of bypass all of the psychological work. And I have to tell you, it is not the case at all. At all. Um, people have to work very hard um, psychologically to do this work, actually. Um, and, you know, the transcendent is, you know, those transcendent experiences are both light and dark. They have a lot of challenging experiences in them, and I think that people are missing this in the greater kind of message um, that's coming out that you know there is a lot of promise here but I think that they're missing the fine print and the fine print is that actually this is really bloody hard work um, and they can't bypass that that psychological work and they're they're because I think unfortunately and this I think happened with mindfulness as well the minute we sort of medicalize an intervention we sort of develop a very passive relationship to it like I'll just take it and lie back and I don't have to do it I don't have to do it don't have to think about it and in some ways that's where you know it's getting compared to to antidepressants it's not like antidepressant you can take an antidepressant and not think about it this is not like that at all you require you're required to be a very active participant in this therapy process um and and not only that but also to have i guess a preparedness to be able to to tolerate and and to you know uh, deal with some challenging experiences should they arise um and I think that, you know, the psychedelic community gets this, you know, that there's a degree of, of um, um, you know, respect and I guess reverence for these plants that, that can produce such profound experiences, but it can grow this way as well. Um, but I'm, I'm a little bit more worried about the general community because they're just hearing all these wonderful things about it, but without actually understanding this is hard work. And it can go in a way that can make you feel quite, um, quite frightened, um, you know, transcendent, you know, or can be quite quite frightening as well you know uh, some people can experience you know this it's you know if you think about like a hindu kind of uh, mystic and they experience this kind of void they can experience that like nirvana but if <laughs> you might be someone who goes that is tab- that is absolutely bloody terrifying actually to have this no sense of self and no mind and you know no ego no no self um so you know we've got a lot we've got a lot of work to do i think in terms of educating and i can completely understand 
um, people's need for something else. And particularly now COVID has just been, people have just been smashed with COVID, um, I think from a mental health point of view. So we're all looking for something. We're all, we've all got this existential ache. Um, and I understand that we're wanting something, but you've got to read the fine print. There's, you have to work hard with this. It's not easy. Sorry. And that I, yeah, it did absolutely deserves the respect and the reverence that it's that it's getting, I guess, in the, in the psychedelic communities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and indigenous a... communities as well. There was yeah. they, uh, you know, I was I was actually in Brazil. I was invited to to you know um, see these these beautiful ayahuasca plants, and it was flowering at the time. And the the uh, the man who was showing us um, this this beautiful flowering ayahuasca plant said have a look at this flower and then asked the plant for permission to pick the flower the reverence for the plant is just extraordinary and i think that there's there's something about that the power of that that there it needs to be translated here we're, we're not doing enough of that talking and i think that i certainly feel that i bear some responsibility in being able to do some talking about this too yeah. Sorry, I've gone off track, but yeah, that's. <laughs> I think you got to no, know what you're no, signing it's, up for. It's good, it's good. Yeah. No, it's, there's a definite sense of um, respect for mm. for the plants when you yeah when you speak to Indigenous people about them. Absolutely, of the the care and respect that they give to them, and and yeah. Um, yeah. you know, like we had Juliana this morning talking about how in Mazatec, you know, they're, yeah. they're really revered quite highly and, yeah. you know, they're, they're treated yeah. at a really special level. Yeah, and so. you're shrouded in ritual and significance and the, the symbolism mm-hmm. of it is just, you know, so... Yeah. And, that, I mean, and that creates a, a, a richer experience for, yeah, for, the, definitely. for the people who are taking it. So, yeah. no, and I, and I certainly am concerned that that's something that we're losing in our kind of Western approach to these yeah. medicines. That, yeah, that yeah. I think that, that we, there's a lot we can learn from Indigenous um, use and sacramental use, but also just the respect of it. And even, you know, the idea that, you know, inappropriate kind of use it was quite frowned upon, actually. They... they um, it was it was understood it was the the i guess the the profundity of it was respected um and i think that i cannot articulate that enough um mm-hmm. having had sit through you know how many sessions now um with you know incredible humans who have um signed up to do this work and again i'd love to be able to tell you about it which I, but i can't but but to to underscore the fact that this is um you know psychedelics a serious business i think that people have just kind of got this idea it'll just kind of yeah, if I just take that, it'll just take my depression away or my anxiety. And so, yeah. Yes. Thank you. It needs to be treated with respect. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Um, I'm going to jump into some of the questions we Please have from do. the chat. Please um, do. We have Sequoia is asked, uh, are there certain types of terminal illness where you would predict psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy uh, may cause harm? Um, yes. I think um, there's a big medical interface, obviously, with um, the patient group that we're looking at. So there's certain things that we would be mindful of. For example, if um, uh, for example, if people are on um, respirators um, and then there's secretions and so forth, and if there's you know increased emotionality, you know you, you're going to get increased secretions. If people are crying, you're going to get more of, of that. So that could be. You know, things like even just from a practical point of view, quite a choking hazard. Um, I think if there are people who have um, uh, brain metastases, we actually don't know the extent to which they can kind of, I guess, uh, um, zip themselves up. Some of those higher order cognitive processes may have been impacted by their um, disease, and we don't have a way sometimes of, of understanding the fullest extent of that. So we would actually um, say that we can't include them in our studies. So people who have, you know, um, brain cancers, for example, are not able to be included in the study unfortunately but we, we just don't know if it's going to be safe or unsafe for them um and um i guess yeah what places where they've got some kind of um um infiltration of disease in the in the brain uh we would be very mindful of, of not kind of bringing them into the study but then yeah it's just from a physiological point of view physiologically actually it's pretty well tolerated but i guess from um we still keep a bit of an eye on things like um uh you know, cardiac function, liver function, kidney function, and so forth. So, but um, we've had actually some pretty pretty crook people um, 
and again, I can't get into details. But I, and they have actually, but they've actually tolerated it very physically. It's been tolerated very, very well. But I guess the main thing is, um, uh, and look, the the ones that kind of go without saying, history of psychosis, history of bipolar at the moment are definite exclusions, and also first degree relatives, and that's kind of in any. Um, protocol um at the moment or most of the protocols i think there's one study at the moment they're they're looking at bipolar i believe overseas um but at the moment uh, it's still a safety exclusion so yeah but but physically it's actually actually pretty pretty well tolerated even with with quite quite unwell people yeah thank you for your question though i think that's a really good one thank you um have you had difficulties recruiting not at all <laughs> <laughs> Not at uh, all. <laughs> are patients keen to be involved or not? Yes, they are. Yep. Um, we've had no problem at all. <laughs> I've worked on clinical trials before and this was uh, this has just been unbelievable. No. Um, the difficulty is screening all the people that, that want to get... I mean, we get in the vicinity of maybe 20, 30 inquiries a day. Now, a lot of them aren't terminally ill, but we get a lot of... Uh, um, yeah we're not struggling <laughs> <laughs> the general inquiry yeah other people write to me you know isn't life a terminal illness you know kind of, so you know um yeah um yeah well, no, no shortage <laughs> at all so yeah we've been very lucky actually so and we've got good um we're very embedded in the the oncology and, and palliative medicine teams at the hospital so we yeah. do get a lot of um um interest from from our clinicians as well so it's been it's been very well received i have to say that the hospital been really supportive so mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been good. Yeah. Are you allowed to say how many patients you have recruited so far? Um, I can. So we've got at the moment one, two, three. I've got about three of what is light up. So we're we're at twenty. Yeah. Twenty. So sort of bang. Okay. Yeah. Although one of them is yet to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that's did, that's did me COVID because I'm behind things? it. It did last year. It right. did last year. This year we were able to sort of push through. It was a little bit uh, trickier. Um, Obviously, we had to put lots of COVID safeguards in place um, because we were dealing largely with people who um, you were immunocompromised. So we had to be mindful of that and also bringing them into the hospital where we actually had COVID uh, patients and so forth. So it was a little tricky, but we were able to, to do it with lots of uh, discussions with our OHS and infection control departments. We got through it. So, but um, yeah, so we're hoping we'll be sort of finishing recruitment around this time next year. Maybe earlier, hopefully. So, yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, okay, another question. Mm -hmm. So, with the passing of voluntary assisted dying laws in many countries and many states, how do you see the incorporation of psychedelic assisted therapy combining, merging, or integrating with voluntary assisted dying? Yeah. Look, I think. Um it's it's an interesting one because what I think was it the Johns Hopkins study that found that it actually reduced the desire for haste and death. Now, one of the things that certainly I've been working with terminally ill um, for maybe the last decade in the hospital, um, and one of the things that commonly comes up is that people say, I don't want to live like this, um, which is completely understandable. Um, and they may opt for um, euthanasia, but they may actually want to see what else is on offer for them before they opt for, um, you know, voluntary assisted dying as well. Um, it's certainly, I mean, if we, we've actually had a couple of inquiries now, someone, you know, who put their name down for voluntary assisted dying, but then also kind of wanted to have a go on the study. Now that's okay. Well, you know, it's not, we're not saying, oh, you can't do that because you're, you know, VAD. Um, the, you know, if that, if that helps them in any way, of course we would, we would offer that to them. So, um, we're, we're really, I mean, we're at the end of the day we're clinicians at heart and i think that if we can reduce the suffering of our patients that's the main thing for us um but if they still want to go down the voluntary assisted dying pathway um that's absolutely their right and that's okay too mm -hmm. but um we, we would hope that yeah if there's some way that we could you know offer them um the the treatment and if they were safe to do so yeah absolutely yeah so yeah yeah um, we have a comment from someone that I'll read out to yep, you. Yeah, sure, please. Uh, so, Dr. Ross, I just yep. wanted to say thank you. I lost oh. both my parents in my early 20s and I know they oh. struggled with it. Oh. I'm so glad people in the future may be able to handle it better. Wow, thank you. Thank you. So, That's um, beautiful. And I'm so sorry that you lost your parents so young. Um, yes. Yeah, and unfortunately there's a lot of people who are dying... Um, 
quite quite scared and quite terrified and we're, we're hoping that we can offer them something else. So thank you for your comment. Hi. We're done. We're done. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> That's it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret.